Let me ask you a question to start our time off here together this morning. Have you ever experienced a time in your life where you had a plan of how something would go, of how something would turn out or happen, only to find that plan getting altered due to the receiving of new information? I know that's been very true for my father. For my father, he has been athletic, he ran, he played basketball, played golf. I assumed that he would retire being able to do those same things, especially playing a lot of golf and playing with his grandkids and traveling, etc. But about 55 years old, he began to notice something. His left hand began to shake out of control. He began to have these tremors on the left side of his body. And so he went to the doctor and after tests and appointments was eventually diagnosed with Parkinson's at 55 years old, which is about 10 years ago which is a disease that affects nerve cells in the brain that produce dopamine. So there's symptoms that include muscle rigidity, you have tremors, uh, changes in your speech, or even the way that you walk. And after the diagnosis, there's various treatments that can help relieve the symptoms, but there is no cure. And this was the information that he received at about 55 years old, just a few years before he was planning on retiring. And upon receiving this news, it greatly outlo- or altered the outlook of his life. What he had planned to do, hoped to do, especially again when he retired, you know, playing golf and traveling and being able to play with his grandkids, all these things became somewhat fuzzy and unclear. And questions began to enter into his mind, which he had never had to think about before. How long will I be able to walk? What will I even be able to do? What will my life look like in the next few years to come? All these questions and many more entered his mind. And needless to say, this information greatly impacted what he thought, what he, or what the thought he thought about his life would look like from retirement on. And it has, it has greatly impacted his life. And we've all experienced situations, little little or big, where new information enters into our life and it greatly affects our world. It shakes our world up quite a bit. It, It distorts or it changes how we look at life or how we see life going. And we find this with the disciples here this morning. Their plans, they had ideas in their head of what it looked like to follow Jesus, of what it, the, who the Messiah was, and all of a sudden all those plans had just changed. They were all wrecked due to information they had received from Jesus. Well, what new information did they receive from Jesus? Well, two things, if you remember a little background here. They received new information about the Messiah. In previous verses to these, verse 18 through 22, Jesus says, while he was praying in private and his disciples were with him, he asked them, what do the crowd say, or who do the crowd say that I am? They answered, John the Baptist, others, Elijah, still others, that one of the ancient prophets has come back. But you, he asked, who do you say that I am? Peter answered, God's Messiah. But he strictly warned and instructed them to tell this to no one, saying, it is necessary that the Son of Man suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests and scribes, be killed and be raised on the third day. And with that statement that Jesus makes about the suffering of the Son of Man and the Messiah, their paradigm of the Messiah was shattered. See, their understanding or their theology of the Messiah was different. It did not include a suffering Messiah. It did not include a dead Messiah, but it included a Messiah who would come and who would reign, who would rule, who would destroy the Romans and the power they had over over Israel, who would restore Israel as the national power, who would restore Jerusalem. And they would reign with this Messiah in this triumphal, in this kingdom that he would set up here on earth. But then Jesus told them something different, that it is necessary for the Son of Man, whom they just confessed that Jesus was the Son of Man, the Messiah, to be rejected, to be killed. That did not fit their theology of the Messiah, did not fit their paradigm at all. That was not a part of their understanding. And not only was their theology of the Messiah as far as what he would do shattered and redefined, but so was their understanding of what it meant to follow him. The second piece of information, they received information about what it meant to follow the Messiah. They just received this, in their minds, this earth-shattering news, news. The Jews had these assumptions. Clearly, the Messiah would come and rule and reign, that he would set up this new kingdom on earth in which Israel would be the ruling nation. He just shares them with them, that's not going to happen, at least not right now. The, the Messiah, I, the Messiah, must first suffer and die. 
And then he shares with them what's true about their life in verse 23 of Luke chapter 9 as we looked at last week. He says, then he said to all of them, if anyone wants to follow me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Jesus just talked about how he would have to suffer and die. And then he looks at the disciples square in the eye and he says, if you want to follow me, you must deny yourself, take up a cross, and follow me. Now, a cross in our day and age, oftentimes, it represents life. We wear them around our neck to symbolize eternal life, to symbolize that we'll be with Jesus. He died for us, that he's no longer on the cross, and he's conquered death and defeated sin. And if we are in Christ, if we repent and put our faith in Jesus Christ, then we too have conquered death and defeated sin because of Jesus. But the cross in their day did not represent life. In fact, far from it. The cross in their day represented one thing, and it was suffering, pain, death. Crucifixion is what went through their minds when they heard the word cross. The Romans crucified many, many people, criminals, and they crucified them publicly, and they crucified them publicly to communicate, this is what will happen to you if you defy us, and they had mastered this punishment of crucifixion. They performed it in the most torturous of ways. And so in the disciples' mind, when they heard, you must take up your cross daily, what they heard is that we must suffer. There's going to be pain, and there may even be death. That following Jesus means that our life, there's going to be suffering and pain and possibly death. That was not in their mindset at all because they thought following the Messiah meant we are going to rule with him in his kingdom. In fact, if you remember Peter, James and John who were going to Jesus said, Jesus, we have one request for you that we could sit at your right and left in your kingdom. Because in their minds, they thought the kingdom was going to be established now, that that's what the Messiah had come to do. They didn't understand the Messiah had come to die and that in order for them to follow the Messiah, they would also have to step into a life of suffering and potentially death, which we know all of them except for John did die. Obviously, for any person in this situation, this would be extremely challenging. These men had just had their world turned upside down. They had believed something so different for so many years. Since they were young, they had been taught one thing about the Messiah, and then all of a sudden, Jesus starts to say something very different. It's never easy to be told something or given information that contradicts what you believe or to find yourself in a situation that you didn't expect to be in. But that's where these men are at when we come to this event possibly the most miraculous event in the New Testament outside of the resurrection of Christ. What event is that? Well, it's the transfiguration of Jesus. The transfiguration of Jesus. These men's lives had just been turned upside down, their theology and understanding of the Messiah, and they were probably somewhat down, depressed, confused. They were for sure confused. They couldn't rationalize, understand what this all exactly meant, but in their minds, they didn't think it was a very good thing, I'm sure. And they were not necessarily pumped about what they had just been taught. And so we enter into this event, this miraculous event, that I believe provides affirmation of what they had just heard and hope ultimately for what is to come. Let's look quickly here at the transfiguration. Verse 28, about eight days after his conversion, Peter took along, or Jesus took along Peter, John, and James and went up on the mountain to pray. Eight days after the conversation, after this information had been shared with him, about a week later, Jesus takes these three men, Peter, James, and John, and he goes up on the high mountain to pray. And up on the mountain, in verse 28, He's praying, or verse 29, the appearance of his face changed, and his clothes became dazzling white. And suddenly two men were talking with him, Moses and Elijah. They appeared in glory and were speaking of his departure, which he was about to accomplish in Jerusalem. So something magnificent and miraculous happens here. In this moment, Jesus' body has changed, and these men see Jesus like they have never seen him before, like no one had seen him before. And they see Moses and Elijah, two greats of the Old Testament, standing with Jesus, talking with him, and a cloud surrounds them, and the voice of God comes from the cloud and speaks to them. This would have been an absolutely amazing experience to have. 
one that is hard to match with any other experience in our life. But when you look at this event, the transfiguration, the natural question that comes to my mind is why? What is the reason for this miraculous and glorious event? That's the question I want to look at here with the remainder of our time this morning. Why did this happen? What is the reason the transfiguration took place? I think there's three kind of big ideas here that we're going to look at this morning. The first one is this. It's to give affirmation and hope to the disciples. It's to give affirmation and hope to the disciples. I think this is in large part what this event was to do, is to affirm the disciples in the teaching they just heard, to encourage and give them support, to press on despite the fact they had just been given information that completely went against their understanding of how things were supposed to be. But how? How are the disciples affirmed, encouraged, and given hope? There's two primary ways. The first way is this, by giving them a glimpse of the glory to come. By giving them a glimpse of the glory to come. We're told that they're on this mountain with Jesus. And Jesus is praying, and in the midst of him praying, he is transformed. The word transformed in the Greek is where we get our English word metamorphosis from. It means to be changed into another form. It's not a simply a changing in your appearance, like you put on makeup or something, or you cut your hair, or you change your clothes. It's a changed, being changed into another form. So you think about, for example, a caterpillar being transformed into a butterfly. I don't know if you can see that very well, but you have a caterpillar on the left and a butterfly on the far right. That's the idea of a transformation, this metamorphosis that took place in What we find in the Gospels is that Jesus was transformed. In Mark 9, verse 2, it says, He was transformed in front of them, and His clothes became dazzling white, extremely white, as no launderer on earth could whiten them. Think about how white you can get your clothes or how white, you know, a t-shirt is when you buy it. It's even whiter than that. That was Jesus. And Luke says, the appearance of his face changed, and his clothes became dazzling white. Matthew tells us he was transformed in front of him, and his face shone like the sun. His clothes became as white as the light. That this something magnificent and marvelous is happening right before their eyes, that in this moment, Jesus' body was changed. And they'd seen Jesus or saw Jesus like they had never seen Jesus before. That he was bright, dazzling white in front of them. I imagine, you know, kind of walking into a dark room and you, it's sunny outside, you pull back the shade, the sun is coming and just hits you right in the face and it's so bright, it kind of takes you back for a moment and your eyes have to adjust. It's something like that, but even greater than that. I can just think of these, you know, Tide commercials when you have the, you know, the, the commercials where the, the sheets are nice and glowing white, and you're like, oh, I wish I could get my clothes and sheets to look like that too. But Jesus here was this bright white light in front of them. It was as though Jesus unzipped himself, and he was showing or allowing the disciples to see him, see him for who he truly is, that he offered them a glimpse into the radiant glory of himself. They saw Jesus in his glory, in this glorious state, this dazzling state, shining brighter than the sun, wider than anything they had ever seen before. And not only was Jesus there, but also we are told that Elijah and Moses appeared with Jesus, and they were talking to him in Mark 9, 4, and Elijah and Moses were there, and they're speaking with Jesus. Now, these men, the disciples, were Jews, and they, though were dull at times, they lacked understanding about the Messiah. It would have been very significant for them to see Jesus with Moses and Elijah. Moses and Elijah were two greats of the Old Testament. It was Moses who represents Israel's deliverer from Egypt. You remember the Exodus story. It was Moses that God used to rescue the Egyptian or the Israelites from the most powerful nation in the world at the time, the Egyptians. He also represented the Israel's lawgiver. You remember on Mount Sinai, it was where God gave the law, the Ten Commandments, to Moses and thus to the people of Israel. 
whereas Elijah was the representative of the last days, and together they represented the law and the prophets. And it was these men of great significance in Jewish history who were standing with Jesus, talking with Jesus. And it says in Luke 9, 31, they appeared in glory and were speaking of his departure, which he was about to accomplish in Jerusalem. So we have Jesus transformed, change appearing in this glorified state, along with these men who were in glory, meaning they were probably appearing in their glorified, resurrected bodies. Now what's interesting is just before this happens, in verse 27, Jesus makes this statement. He says, truly, I tell you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God. Now, there's varying interpretations and opinions about verse 27. One of those is that it connects to this event, the transfiguration of Jesus. That there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God. That it was in this moment that possibly Jesus fulfilled this promise, that some, some would see the kingdom of God in power before death. That it was in this event that Jesus then gave them a glimpse of what it would be like when he returns in glory. That it was in this event that they were given an incredible opportunity to see the kingdom of God in power. Remember, their understanding about what would take place when the Messiah returned would come. They were expecting to reign with him in glory as the kingdom was set up on the earth as the nation of Israel was restored as the ruling nation of the world. And the transfiguration of Jesus confirmed, was confirming the truth of this future event, that it would happen, but it was not quite yet. This glory would come, but it would be at a later time. They got a little taste of the kingdom of God, a little taste of the glory that they would experience. It's like Christmas is coming and you see presents underneath the Christmas tree and you're anticipating, you see them, but it's not quite yet time to open them, but you're anticipating the time that you can. There was this sense of anticipation. They got a glimpse of the glory that would come with Christ. Jesus, in his grace and mercy, gave them something to affirm this future glory, the kingdom coming in power, and to encourage them to press on till that day. Because remember, Jesus said, this day is coming, but until that day, you must follow me, and to follow me, you have to bear a cross, which means there's suffering and pain ahead. But he wanted to affirm, to give them hope that this day was, in fact, coming. Yet, I think what's interesting when you look at this event as you notice something here about the disciples and what they were doing. We're told in verse 32 that Peter and those with him, James and John, were in a deep sleep. You know, we tend to find Peter and others sleeping when Jesus is praying. The Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus is praying right before he's going to the cross in absolute agony and pain, knowing that death is right there in front of him, and yet his disciples are over there just passed out. We see here that in this moment, this glorious moment, what do we find the disciples doing? They're sleeping. Uh, They tend to, when Jesus is praying, they tend to be sleeping. Uh, It's just what happens. I don't know if you've ever been in that situation in your life where you're praying with people and you look over and they're just passed out. They're just totally zonked out. They're like this. And their head's just bobbing back and back and forth and you're praying. And then they just, at the end, they wake up, amen, amen, you know, (laughs) amen. Yeah, I was with you the whole time. It's like, yeah, sure you were. (laughs) It's pretty convenient, though, because when you pray, a lot of times you close your eyes. So I guess, you know, you don't really know what was actually happening. But eventually they woke up. In verse 32, when they became fully awake, they saw his glory in the two men who were standing with him. What's interesting here is Peter's response. I think he recognizes how amazing this situation, this event is, but not quite fully understanding, but to some degree, and so he begins to open up his mouth. And in response, this is what Peter says. As these two men were departing from him, Peter said to Jesus, Master, it is good for us to be here. Let us set up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. Not knowing what he was saying. Peter, like usual, he is the first to speak. He rushes to speak, and he's notorious for saying things that don't make him look very good. A few days prior to this, Jesus, if you remember, rebuked him because Peter was saying, no, no, you're not going to die. This isn't going to happen to you. And he says, get behind me, Satan. I don't think it's a good thing when Jesus calls you Satan, right? I just don't think that's what you want to be called. 
And so I think in an attempt, though, to not sound stupid, he, but to sound, and to sound disrespectful, he calls Jesus and Mark rabbi, or in Matthew he says Lord, while in Luke he says master, and then he says, it's good for us to be here. And I'm just like, no duh it is, Peter. Of course it's good for you to be here. I'm thinking, what is Jesus thinking right now? It's like, well, duh, Mr. Obvious, like, of course. Yes, this is a good place for you to be. And he's like, let's just set up three tabernacles or shelters, one for you and for Moses and Elijah. What's going on here? Well, there's some conjecture about what's happening. I think in some sense, Peter's trying to, he's trying to keep this thing going. It's like, man, he's like, I just want the kingdom to be set up now. I just want this to happen now. So let's just build these shelters and keep everything now. But Mark tells us, in whom Peter actually was his source in writing the gospel of Mark, says, because he did not know what to say since they were terrified. That Peter, in some respects, he just didn't know what he was saying. I don't know if you've ever been in that situation where there's just something happening and you're like kind of stumbling to get words out of your mouth and then you say something and you're like, you wish you kind of put that back in your mouth because it's like kind of, it's just kind of dumb, right? It's like, it's just been better if I kept my mouth shut. Like even a fool seems smart when he just keeps his mouth closed. But Peter didn't, he didn't know what to say. And there's a sense of fear that had overcome them. I mean, Jesus was before them in this dazzling state. The Apostle John in Revelation 1, when he sees Jesus in something similar to this, he just falls down in absolute fear and terror. Isaiah, when he sees God, Ezekiel, when they see God, they just fall down in sheer terror. There's this fear because they're in the presence of this holy God. But in this moment, although Peter is confused and saying different things, Jesus is trying to affirm them and encourage them by giving them a glimpse of the glory that is to come. But secondly, the way he affirms them is through affirming the identity of Jesus. That in this transfiguration of Christ, the identity of Christ is affirmed. Remember, Peter just confess that Jesus is the Messiah. And right after he confesses Jesus is the Messiah, Jesus drops this bombshell of information on him. The Messiah must suffer and die. And oh, by the way, Peter, if you're going to follow me, you must suffer and you may die. Peter had just communicated, no, you're the Messiah. And then in return, what he's told is the Messiah is going to die and you may die. I don't think that's what Peter was expecting when he confessed Jesus to be the Messiah. And again, I'm sure in that moment there's lots of confusion and somewhat of a shock and kind of a set back, being set back on your heels like, wait a minute, what? No, this wasn't the game plan I had in mind. And so what this event does is I think it affirms that the confession that Peter made, the disciples made, was right. This is right. What you're confessing that Jesus is the Messiah is right. How? Well, three ways. First way is by the changing of his appearance. As we already said, Jesus' appearance dramatically changed. This true transformation took place. Luke tells us in Luke 9, 29, the appearance of his face changed. His clothes became dazzling white. This is reminiscent of Old Testament experiences where people experience the glory of God. Moses, for example. Remember Moses in Exodus 33 and 34, God passed in front of him, let him see his glory, and he was in the crevice of a rock, and after he was, his face was glowing. And he had to hide his face because it was glowing, it was reflecting the glory of God. But what you find Jesus here is Jesus wasn't reflecting the glory of God, rather Jesus is described as he is glorious. It's radiating from him. And it's radiating from him. He is glorious because he is in fact glorious. He is God. Hebrews chapter 1, the author of Hebrews points this out in verse 3. He says, the sun is the radiance of God's glory and the exact expression of his nature, sustaining all things by his powerful word. The word radiance expresses the concept of sending forth light or shining forth. When Jesus was transfigured, he was, in a sense, opening himself up. 
He was opening himself up. The, the change they saw was coming from within him, revealing what was already there because this is who he is. He is the exact expression of his nature, meaning Jesus is the exact representation of the nation, nature and essence of God in time and space. He is God. Therefore, he is glorious. This is who he is. And this glory was seen in the Old Testament, and then this glory is seen in the New Testament. It's the glory of God, and this affirmed to them that he was, in fact, the one sent by God. Second is that his association with Moses and Elijah. Verse 30, suddenly two men were talking with him, Moses and Elijah. These two men appear with Jesus, and as I said, they're prominent figures in the Old Testament. Two of the most prominent figures, you ask any Jew in the Old Testament, Moses And Elijah, Moses, whom we do not know where his body was buried, Elijah, who was taken up in chariots of fire. And it was understood that Moses was the model for the ultimate prophet to be sent by God. Deuteronomy 18, 15, Moses writes, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among your own brothers. This is again reiterated or spoken again in Acts by Peter. Moses said, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among your brothers and sisters. You must listen to everything he tells you. And this is in reference to Jesus, the Messiah, that Jesus is the greater prophet that Moses was speaking about. And then you have Elijah, and it was understood that he would be the forerunner coming before the Messiah to prepare the return of the Messiah. Remember in Malachi chapter 4, he says, remember the instruction of Moses, my servant, the statutes and ordinances I commanded him at Oreb or Mount Sinai for all Israel. Look, I'm going to send you the prophet Elijah before the great and terrible day of the Lord comes. So you have these two prominent men of the Old Testament, prominent roles in the Old Testament appear with Jesus, both having something written about them in regards to this coming Messiah as in regard to Jesus. Now remember in the Old Testament, in order for an event to be confirmed as fact, there had to be two or three witnesses. Therefore, these men appearing with Jesus served as the two witnesses testifying that this is Jesus, that this Jesus is in fact the Messiah that they have been waiting for, that the Old Testament was building up and that all the Jews were waiting for this Messiah who would rescue them, that Moses and Elijah affirmed that Reality, the number three, the most clear affirmation of Jesus' identity is the voice of heaven. While he was saying this in verse 34, a cloud appeared and overshadowed them. They became afraid as they entered the cloud. Then a voice came from the cloud saying, this is my son, the chosen one, with, or listen to him. A cloud appeared over these men. Matthew says it was a bright cloud. And every Jew knew what was associated with a cloud appearing over people, that it was God. For it was God who was hidden in the form of a cloud that spoke to the people at Mount Sinai, the giving of the law that led Israel after the exodus from Egypt, that manifested his glory to the people in the wilderness. Not to mention it was with clouds that the Messiah was predicted to return and set up his kingdom. And it was from this cloud that enveloped them that God spoke, and he said, this is my beloved son. Listen to him. If there's any doubt in your mind, if you're Peter, James, and John, is the confession we just made that Jesus is the Messiah, knowing that he just gave us this information, is there any doubt that the confession we just made is wrong or right? It's like there's no doubt that what we said was right. Because God himself spoke to these men and said, this is my beloved son. This is the chosen one. This is the anointed one, the one you've been waiting for, so listen to him. And so this event was in a large part to affirm and encourage the disciples to verify that what they said was in fact true, but there's also a couple other purposes and much shorter purposes, but number two is this, is to give affirmation and encouragement to Jesus. This point in time in Jesus' life, he's less than a year from his death. My opinion in view of the suffering that was ahead, 
This event was also to affirm Jesus and his mission and encouraging him to press on to complete the mission he was given. You know, Jesus was God in the flesh, meaning he was human, and he experienced difficulty just like we do. Life wasn't necessarily easy just because he was God. He experienced emotional pain. You remember when he wept at the death of Lazarus, his friend. He experienced physical pain. You remember in the Garden of Gethsemane where he is sweating out drops of blood and in agony because the cross is right before him, and he was tempted like we were tempted, yet he never sinned. You know, Matthew 14, or Matthew 4, 11, where the devil left him and immediately angels came and began to serve him that right after he was tempted, you see the angels coming and they're ministering to him. You find him again in the Garden of Gethsemane, Mark chapter 14, he takes his disciples with him to pray right before he's arrested. You know, he goes a bit further, falling to the ground in agony due to suffering because death was imminent. It was so close. And these were difficult situations in Jesus' life, and in both situations, it appears that Jesus was wanting fellowship, that he needed fellowship, he needed encouragement. The angels came and ministered to him, and the disciples there were with him, his friends. And Luke tells us upon this mountain, there's these two men, Moses and Elijah, and they're appearing in glory with him, and they're speaking of his departure, which he was about to accomplish in Jerusalem. In other words, they're talking about the death of Jesus. That Jesus' mission, that he was to go and he was to die. This was looming over Jesus. This was the, the mission of Jesus. Imagine having that just sitting over you. Knowing that everything in your life was aiming for that time when you would go and suffer and die. And Jesus wasn't just suffering physically in the sense from the crucifixion, from the beating that he would and did experience, but also from the the punishment of the wrath of God being poured out on him for the sin of the world that was committed against God. And that he would be forsaken by his Father. The pain and suffering that Jesus would experience I think this was as much to encourage him. Moses and Elijah, they weren't, you know, fist pounding, Jesus, come on, here we go, Jesus, no big deal, just take this thing on. It's like, man, this was a difficult road that lay ahead, and in nowhere to the Gospels do we find Jesus at all just kind of making this out to be not a big deal. I mean, he asked his father to take the cup away. If there's any other way for this to happen. He felt the pain and suffering before he even got to the pain and the suffering of the cross. And as a good friend who is encouraging, it seems like Jesus needed to be encouraged in what was going on. And we all need this, and so did Christ. And not only did affirmation come from them, but also it came from, more importantly, his Father. The words that Jesus, or that the Father speaks, is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. Or another way to say it is I take delight in Him. These words were as much for the disciples as they may have been for Jesus. Not only at His baptism, when His ministry started, did He hear these words spoken over, over Him by the Father. But again, not far from His death, the culmination of His ministry, He hears these words again. And oftentimes there is nothing more comforting in difficult situations than to hear your parents' voice, than to hear your mother or your father to tell you, I love you, I delight in you, keep going, I know this is hard, but it's good. It's nothing, there's nothing more comforting than that. And so this event not only affirmed the disciples and the teaching they had recently heard, but it also affirmed and encouraged Jesus, I believe, in his mission. And lastly, it's to affirm the plan that suffering will come. Now, this is not in Luke's gospel, but it is in Mark's gospel. In Mark, he writes, suddenly looking around, they no longer saw anyone with them except Jesus. And as they were coming down the mountain, he ordered them to tell no one what they had seen until the Son of Man had risen from the dead. And they kept this word to themselves, questioning what rising from the dead meant. Again, Jesus instructs them to be quiet. He tells them not to say anything until after his resurrection. And they're going down the mountain and they're talking about what is rising from the dead mean. Again, this stuff didn't harmonize with their idea of the Messiah dying. 
And rather than kind of going on or, or clarifying this question about the resurrection, they went on and they said to Jesus, or asked Jesus, why do the scribes say that Elijah must come first? Now, how does Elijah fit into this? Because they had confessed Jesus to be the Messiah, and in this event, it was clearly confirmed that he is the Messiah, but isn't Elijah supposed to come before the Messiah? And Jesus says to them in Matthew 17, verse 10, or verse 11, Elijah is coming and will restore everything, he replied. But I tell you, Elijah has already come, and they didn't recognize him. On the contrary, they did whatever they pleased to him in the same way the Son of Man is going to suffer at their hands. Now, Mark, he just kind of leaves it there. They didn't understand, but Matthew records in verse 13, then the disciples understood that he spoke to them about John the Baptist. After all this, though, they still didn't quite understand what was going on, and still being re-educated and convinced of the plan, still hoping that suffering wouldn't come, Jesus says, no, suffering is going to come. Do you remember how they treated John the Baptist? They cut off his head. Therefore, they will do the same to me. And as we know, they'll do the same to you. The truth is, there still remains that suffering must come before glory, that pain will come before there is real gain. And this was true for them, and this is true for us today as well. The Christ has called us to a life in which there will be pain and suffering, in which there will be great difficulty, in which there will be hardship for following him. There will be glory, but before we enter into glory, there will be pain. In closing, what I want to give you is just three applications. The last two relating to that idea of suffering. The first one, a little bit different here. The first one is this, listen to the Word of God. What do we do? When you look at this event, what should we take away from it? One of those things is to listen to the Word of God. Let the Word of God define how you live. Why do I bring that up? Well, Peter is talking about building shelters, and God the Father, in one sense, interrupts Peter from his whole thing about building shelters, trying to retain this moment or saying whatever is kind of in his mind, and he directs him to his word. And this is what he says, remember again, in the cloud, this is my son, the chosen one, listen to him. Listen to him. What should you do? Listen to him. The thrust of this passage was to affirm Jesus' authority that what he says is in fact true. It was to affirm that the disciples were to accept what Jesus taught, even if it contradicted their understanding of what the Messiah would do, of what it meant to actually follow him. See, remember, their whole world was being turned upside down. Their, their ideology or their theology about the Messiah was in stark contrast to what Jesus was saying. I mean, they just found out that the Messiah was going to die and that they then were going to have to suffer as well, bear a cross like the Messiah would have to bear a cross. And what God the Father says to them is, listen. Listen to him. He's right. You know, Peter writes about this later. In 2 Peter chapter 1, he writes about this event He says, for we did not follow cleverly contrived myths when we were made known to you, when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, and said we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For he received honor and glory from God the Father when the voice came came to him from the majestic glory saying, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. We ourselves heard his voice when it came from heaven while we were with him on the holy mountain. We also have the prophetic word strongly confirmed, and you will do well to pay attention to it. As to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star arises in your heart. What, G, or what Peter is recounting here is this event, the transfiguration. And he says, we didn't make any of this stuff up about Jesus. We actually got a glimpse of him and his power and glory. What we're telling you is a historical event that we witnessed with our very own eyes. And we heard the voice of God who clearly spoke over his son Jesus saying, he is the Messiah, he is the chosen one. In fact, he is the Savior. And then Peter makes this statement. So we have in verse 19, the prophetic word strongly confirmed, or as another translation puts it, moreover, we possess the prophetic word as an altogether reliable thing. What is Peter saying? Well, I think he's saying what we experience is backed up by the Old Testament scriptures, and what we experience at the same time confirms them. 
It confirms them. In other words, the Scriptures are altogether reliable. They are trustworthy. And so what is Peter's conclusion? You will do well to pay attention to it. In other words, you will do well to pay attention to the Word of God. You will do well to listen to the Word of God. So you can think about in your own life, do you give attention to the Word of God? Do you actually listen to the Word of God? See, to to listen to Jesus is to listen to His Word. To give attention to Jesus is to give attention to His Word, that He is the Word made flesh, that the Word of God is what we are to give our attention to. As Christians, the Word of God is what we are to listen to. It's what we are to give time to. It's what we are to let define our life. What defines you? What defines how you live? Is it you or God? Peter, James, John, they had this idea, these assumptions about the Messiah and what it meant to follow him, and then their world was presented with something totally different. And what you find from these men is they let Jesus' word define for them who he was and how they were to live. In the culture we live in today, what we have done so often is we decide who God is and we decide how we're, what it means to follow him. And it's completely the wrong approach to take. See, a believer in Christ takes the word of God and what the word of God says about God and about you as it relates to God is what you conform your life to. When it comes to what you believe about God, what you believe about heaven and hell, what you believe about sin, about humanity, about morality, about sexuality, what defines, what defines it for you? What defines for you what it means to follow Jesus? Is it Jesus? And to listen to Jesus, to give attention to Jesus, is then to obey Jesus. And in our obedience to Jesus and in his word, we will find life. And in obedience to Jesus, we will experience glory. And in our obedience to Jesus, we will know Christ. But also in our obedience to Jesus, as I said a moment ago, we will also experience difficulty and suffering. For we too, like Jesus, will bear a cross differently. But we'll bear a cross. In other words, we will suffer. And so Jesus has offered us encouragement and hope. And so the next application is this, is look to Jesus for encouragement and hope to keep going. When you are faced with suffering, particularly as it relates to following Christ, what do you turn to? Who do you turn to? Who we should turn to first and foremost is Jesus. Hebrews chapter 12 instructs us to do so. Let us run with endurance the race that lies before us, keeping our eyes on Jesus, the source and perfecter of our faith. For the joy that lay before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. He sits above all things, enthroned in power, in all authority. He says, for consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself so that you won't grow weary and give up. See, in your life and following Christ, there will be hostility. You will experience hostility from others. In some way, shape, or form, there will be tensions at minimum in relationships that you have with other people. And I've experienced this over and over and over again in my life that following Christ has created tensions and hostility in relationships with other people who don't want to follow Christ, even if they claim the name of Christ. Whether they claim the name of Christ or they don't claim the name of Christ, you will experience hostility from other people. There will be suffering in your life. And so what are you to do? You are to look to Jesus, the source and perfecter of our faith, the one who has gone before us, who has endured the cross. He's endured the pain and the suffering. He's conquered and defeated death and sin for you. You are to look to him because by looking to him, there is real hope because Christ, he is the anchor for our souls. 
He is the victor over death, over sin. And so when life is hard, when it's difficult, who are you to turn to? Well, first and foremost, Christ. But then secondly, know that Jesus has given us one another for encouragement to keep us going. You know, we're described as the body of Christ. Think about your body, it's attached, it's together. One part functions with another part, and one part benefits another part. One part helps another part, and so on. The Christian life is not a solo effort. It's not a a race, an individual race, where we're just kind of out doing our own thing, in our own lane, disconnected from other people, but rather the Christian life is a race, it's a team effort race. They were to live this life together. And what God has done is, and in His wisdom and in His mercies, He's given us one another to encourage each other in the mission that God has given to us. Hebrews 10, one place that points us out, and let us watch out for one another to provoke love and good works, not neglecting to gather together as some in the habit of doing, but encouraging each other daily and all the more as you see the day approaching. What day approaching? The day of Christ's return. That we are to work to encourage one another, to uplift one another, to help one another, to come alongside one another. That is the responsibility that we, each of us, has been given to one another. To partner up, so to speak. To live this life together. I mean, I don't know about you, but it's so comforting to my soul to know that I have so many people with me as I'm walking with Christ, encouraging me, imploring me to do what is right. In the face of difficulty, it is always so comforting to have someone there with you. And this is what God has given to us. He's given us one another in part to encourage us to keep going to keep fighting until Christ takes us home or until he returns. Let's pray. Father, we are so grateful for your son Jesus that he came and died in our place to pay for our sin. And Lord, I pray that it does not be something that we just know intellectually, but it's something that we really do believe in our heart of hearts. That we really do believe that you, Jesus, are the chosen one. You are God made flesh. And you died 2,000 years ago on a cross in the most brutal of ways. And you experienced the wrath of God poured out on you because of the sin that I, we have committed. And God, in the death of your son, you promise to those of us who believe in him and his death and resurrection, that we repent and we actually confess him as Lord and Savior of our life, that we too, God, that we will experience the forgiveness of sin and the hope of eternal life. And I pray, God, that we would not minimize that hope, but, Lord, we would meditate daily on the reality of what you've done for us, Jesus. That we give adequate time and attention to you. That we would listen to you that we'd center our lives completely on you. God, help us to be an encouragement to one another to do that, to pursue that. We pray these things, Jesus, in your name. Amen.